if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Romans chapter 5. We're going to, uh, over the next several months, as I've been kind of planning out our preaching calendar, I try to get series or do things. We often go through books of the Bible, but we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we kind of started it uh, with the last series. We did three weeks in talking about how Jesus is our example, and we're going to kind of do several sort of mini-series, if you will, over the next several months. Uh, we're going to look this week and two more weeks about uh, how God has given us a special access as his uh, children. And then we're going to do a couple of weeks around Easter, and then we're going to be talking about uh, a heart for the gospel in the spring. And so uh, I just invite you to kind of uh, stick with us and, and really sort of pay attention to what uh, our teaching is about because I think God's really got some exciting things for us as a church. In Romans chapter 5, we have uh, in verse number 2 a word there that is translated as the word access, which is kind of an interesting word. And that Greek word, it's translated as access all three times that it's used in, in Scripture. But that Greek word and the word access is only used three different times. It's used here in Romans and then twice in the book of Ephesians. And so we want to look at what is it that God gives us access to. Uh, we think of access, uh, I think the, the most obvious analogy for us is the idea of a key. You know, in, in uh, church work, Keys are given, well, we pretty much hand out keys to anybody, but keys are given to people that need access and people that typically are in leadership or in service of some sort. Uh, we, we give our, our deacon board, those guys have keys so that they can get in, presumably to do some work, but mostly just to check up on if the pastor's napping. Um, but you have a key to your house, or maybe you have a code to your house, and you give that to people that you want to have access. The idea being that everyone who doesn't have a key or doesn't have that code, you don't want to have access. So in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1, it says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, by way of introduction, let's walk through this verse. Put verse 1 back up there if you would. Let's walk through this verse. Therefore, which refers to everything that he's been writing about in the previous chapters. It's interesting, in, in chapter 4, he talks about Abraham and how Abraham was faithful to God. Even though we know Abraham often failed God, because of his faith in God, God accounted him righteous. And then he says here, therefore, having been justified by faith. That word justified is a legal term declaring us innocent. Uh, oftentimes we say it's just as if I'd never sinned. So being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, we could, we could talk for several weeks about just that verse about how God has declared us innocent, how we at once were at enmity or were enemies with God, but now we have peace with God, and that peace comes through Jesus Christ. But we want to look at verse number two. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And so verse 1 tells us God declares you innocent. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. God and that comes because we once were sinners destined to have to be judged because of that sin, but through the sacrifice of Christ, we're justified, giving us a relationship, peace with God. And then he says, God gives us access to the grace in which we stand. In other words, positionally, this is where we're at. 
We're at peace with God. We're declared innocent as followers of Jesus Christ. But now we have access to this grace. We have a deeper level of relationship. I, a couple of years ago, it's actually been over 10 years ago now, uh, we did a couple of things as our, our extended family. My mom got this idea, and uh, one time we went and toured Coors Field. And uh, they, they take you around. It would, you can sign up for it. It's usually either not during the season or definitely not on a game day. But they let you in, and, and on this off day, you get to walk around. You get to see kind of how the concessions work and sort of behind the scenes. And you, we got to go and, and uh, go down into the dugout and get onto the edge of the field. But even within that, there are still things that we didn't have access to. Uh, another time we, we did a tour of, of uh, whatever it's called this week, Mile High Stadium. Um, and so uh, I know it's called Empower Field. Uh, but we got to, it wasn't called that then, but we got to go to uh, the, the newer, the, for people that have been around a while, right, the new Mile High Stadium. And same thing, uh, they have a Colorado Sports Hall of Fame in there, and then you got to go down into the tunnels, you got to see where they pull in the big semis when they're going to do a nationally broadcast game. And we got to go out onto the edge of the field. And, and uh, they took us up and showed us the press boxes and the different suites. But they told us about the owner's suite, but we didn't get to see it. They told us about the Rockies clubhouse, but we didn't get to go in there. That was players only. They told us about the Rocky or the Broncos locker room, and we got to see pictures of it, but we didn't get to go in there. We got to go in the visitors' locker room, but not the Broncos. Why? Because while we got increased access, we didn't have full access. We we weren't at that level. You want to get at that level? You got to make the NFL right. You got to be a major league player. Those guys can pretty much go wherever they want. Or you can own the team. I guess those guys probably can go wherever they want. I don't have to worry about either making a pro sports franchise or owning a team, I don't think. But God gives us full access to his grace. We get the full version of that. That's important because, you know, sometimes people will say to me, oh, pastor, you know, uh, what's it like to pastor a church? Or what does, listen, as a pastor, I, I have responsibilities that I will answer before God, but I don't have any more insight into Scripture. I don't have any more access to God than anybody else. We're all, we're all saints, we're adopted children of Him. We are at peace with God, and God has given us access. As I studied that Greek word, and I'm not even going to try to say it for you today, the truth is this. That word doesn't have any sort of deep, hidden meaning. Neither does the word access. It actually means exactly what it sounds like on the surface, which is God opens the doors for us. We get full access to him and to his grace. And so this morning we're gonna look at that and I don't know that you're gonna hear anything this morning that is real new that maybe you haven't heard before but I hope it's a good reminder of where we are with Jesus Christ. Access to God's grace means a couple of things for us. Number one, it means I don't have to work for it. I don't have to work for it. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God's grace to us is a gift. It is not something that you have to earn. It is not something that you've got to be good enough. You've got to work for. You've got to hope that maybe you'll pass a test. Uh, listen, God's grace is a gift to us, and we don't have to work for it. None of us are saved by what we do. 
the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, wrote to his protege in the ministry, Timothy. This man who the Bible says was full of grace and power, who did amazing things in, in, in God's ministry, even himself. But Paul, writing to Timothy, says this in 2 Timothy 1.9, who has, been, who has saved us, talking about Paul's relationship with Christ and, and, and Paul and Timothy's relationship with Christ. He said, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Not according to our works. And yet, Paul's works were significant, weren't they? I mean, this guy suffered for the cause of Christ. This guy preached for the cause of Christ. He started churches on multiple continents. This guy preached before kings and magistrates. He, he eventually gave his life for the cause of Christ. And you know what he said? That's not why God saved me. God saved me because of his purpose, not because of the works that I've done. It's a gift of God. And so we need to stop trying. Now that doesn't mean that we don't take sin seriously. That doesn't mean we don't take our walk with Christ seriously. But it means that we, so much of the time, we know this. And even as a church, I want to make sure that we try to, try to always preach this and revel in this. And yet, I know personally my tendency, and I believe our tendency as people, is we want to try to work for it. I mean, we, we know it's a free gift, but I, I, want to, I want to be deserving of it. You are not deserving of the grace of God. And, and what do we mean by grace? You know, the mercy means you, you don't get what you deserve. That's mercy. Mercy is like you're caught red-handed, you deserve punishment, and you don't get it, that's mercy. You know what grace is? Grace is getting something you don't deserve. For us, grace is getting God's, God's favor, God's love, God, getting forgiveness, getting the adoption as sons and daughters into his family. This is the grace that God gives to us. And he has already given to it to us. And so we need to stop trying to earn it. How do we get God's grace? We trust in him. That's what Ephesians says, right? Ephesians says, by grace you are saved through faith. That's trust. Even Romans says that God's grace, God's this justification comes to us through faith. And so we need to stop trying and just trust. Trust that God is doing a work in us. Trust that God has given his grace to us. John chapter 1 and verse 12 says this, but as many as received him, talking about Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. As many as received him, to them he gave the right. I was thinking about that a little bit this week. That when we think about God's grace, we know that we're undeserved. We know that we, we are getting something we don't deserve. And yet he, he says, I give you the right to be the sons, the children of God. Well, we like our rights, don't we? I mean, we want to stand up for our rights. We want to make sure nobody's infringing on our rights. But you know what the rights we have scripturally? We have rights as children of God, our rights with our relationship with God. And he says here in John, as many as received it, we get a gift when we receive it. Now the truth is this. Um, I'm just gonna be transparent with you and deal with my wife later, but one of the things in ministry is we get a lot of, uh, pe people like to show their appreciation, and, and I appreciate that, 
and we get gift cards. And I'm not good with gift cards. Um, my wife is better than I am. She's not always great. Sometimes we'll go out to eat to a place because we have a gift card and then forget and pay for it and then go home and realize we didn't use the gift card. And we're like, oh, we gotta go there again, <laughs> which is fine. I mean, yeah, we get to go out to eat. My wife has a little part in her wallet that's just full of gift cards. And every once in a while, uh, we'll be doing something and she's like, well, let's go there. We have a gift card. And I'm like, we do? That's ice cream. We should have used that already or whatever it is. We, we, have to, we have to receive that gift. God offers to us his grace, but we've got to receive it. We've got to use it. And so we have to remember that access to God's grace means we don't have to work for it. It also means we don't have to work to keep it. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9 says this, he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Christ says, my grace is sufficient for you. It is enough. The access that I give you is sufficient. It is secure. Now, I enjoy heist movies. And the general plot of heist movies is to create a scenario in which there is uh, something to be stolen or accessed that can never be stolen or accessed. The security is so great. And then uh, thieves or spies decide uh, that they are so smart and ingenious that they find a way to access or steal the unaccessible or something that cannot be stolen, right? And that's the whole plot of it. I mean, maybe they have to steal somebody's fingerprint. And then that's not enough, right? So then you have to steal somebody's eyeball. And then you have to, you know, smoke, spray smoke so you can see all the lasers and then be a world-class gymnast so you can get through them all. They create some kind of crazy robot or, or do some kind of great physical thing and they, and they, and they, they access or steal whatever there is they're looking for. There's no data that can be kept safe and that it's kind of the world in which we live. And so we lose sight of this idea that we have security in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus would say things like, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where thieves can't break in and steal, where there's no moth doesn't corrupt. We're always trying to figure out how to hold on to things, right? How to, how to preserve things. You ever find a box or an album of old pictures and over time they've, they've faded and, and they've changed and, and they're not as sharp and as bright as they once were? And so then we digitize them. And I was listening the other day and someone was talking about, uh, I forget what, exactly what they called it, but like digital fade or digital breakdown and how over time things could kind of deteriorate. And I thought, what in the world? Even we can't digitize things and keep them safe. And then we have passwords, right? You create a password. Listen, we, went, we tried to watch a movie last night. It started 15 minutes late in my house because I had to reset my password and I couldn't figure out, first of all, I had to figure out the old password to be able to get a new password and then my new password wasn't strong enough and I wanted to show the computer how strong I was but that wasn't gonna work. What a pain. And then I'm thinking, I hope I can remember this password because I only have like three and I always go to variations of those and I tried to do a new one because it didn't like the old three and you know, it's just a pain. And it seems like nothing in this world is secure. But in Jesus Christ, our grace is secure. We don't have to work to keep it. We depend upon him, not upon ourselves. 
2 Corinthians 3, verse 4 and 5 says, And we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Sufficiency, the idea that it is enough. There's security there, and it's not dependent upon us. Because listen, if it was dependent upon us, we'd, we'd figure out a way to mess it up, right? We'd lose it. We'd forget it. But we depend on Christ. Our access is kept in heaven. Jesus said this in talking to his disciples. He said, behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I thought this was interesting. Jesus is giving his disciples instruction. He's gonna send them out to do ministry. And in that, he is divesting in them divine power. He said, you've got power over scorpions and snakes. You, you could get bit by a poisonous snake and it's not gonna kill you. You have, uh, he, he tells them in other parts that you have power over, over demons and over principalities. You've got this, this power to heal. And he gives them this power. And then he says, don't rejoice in that. Don't, don't take pride in that. Don't be excited about that. You should be rejoicing about the fact that your name is written in heaven. Several times in Scripture, Jesus several times refers to this, and then it's often referred to in Revelation, this idea that our names are written in heaven. Because when our names are written in heaven, they're written. They're down. They're secure. You know, we write down things to try to remember them, right? That, that's, that's a technique that, that most of us use. But you ever run across notes and it reminds you of something that you've totally forgotten? I do. Listen, in my desk I have, I have stacks. And, and every week or two I've got to go through those stacks to remind myself of the projects that I need to be working on and the things that I need to be accomplishing. And sometimes a paper will get kind of stuck in it in between two things, or a, I, I, won't, I won't get to it for a couple of weeks, and I'll pull it out, and I'm like, oh, I've got, I, like, I gotta call this person, or I gotta work on this thing, or I, I should be pushing this, this project forward. And, and I haven't thought about that. It has not entered my mind in a week or maybe two. Why? Because not secure. <laughs> right? It's like a steel trap, but uh, things are escaping out of it. But when our names are written in heaven, they are secure. It is sufficient. And so our trust is not in ourselves. Our trust is in Jesus. And then finally, I should live differently because of it. See, we don't work to earn the grace of God, it is a gift. We don't have to worry about earning it and we don't have to worry about keeping it. But we do need to appreciate it. Sometimes we get gifts that we appreciate more than others, right? I mean, sometimes you get a gift and you're like, this is, this is exactly what I want. Uh, my wife is great at giving gifts. She often gives me things that I never thought about, but when I get them, I'm like, this is so great, this is perfect. That's the best kind of gift. Sometimes I've gotten gifts that I never thought about, and I never wanted. Not from my wife, from other people, not, not, none of you, people far away. We've all gotten those gifts, right? Or you open it up and you're like, thanks? 
But God has given us his grace. And we can't earn it. We don't have to worry about keeping it, but we are to appreciate it. We, we show our appreciation in the way in which we live. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1 says this, We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Not to receive the grace of God in vain. We need to appreciate the gift that God has given to us. Romans chapter 6 beginning in verse 12 says this, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Part of Part of understanding the gift that we've been given is to then enjoy it but appreciate it. Listen, I don't, I, I don't give my kids gifts for them not to, to use them, not to, to appreciate them. Uh, my son's into outdoor things, and so probably for the last five years, pretty much every gift he gets is related to that. It's a, it's a backpack or uh, something related to snowboarding or hiking or, or something that we know he wants. And we don't give him those things so that he can put them in his closet. This year we gave him a, a backpack. Listen, I don't want to see that thing hanging on his wall and looking all pretty. I, I want to see it get dirty. I, I want to see it get a little scuffed up. Not for him to abuse it, but for him to use it. That's what we're giving it to him for, right? When I was little, uh, it, when my kids were little, and I would give them toys, I, I wouldn't want them to just look at the box and go, oh, Daddy, it's so pretty, and put it up on a shelf and not use it. I knew it was a good gift when the box got destroyed in the process of opening it because they wanted to get to the toy so much and they wanted to play with it. That's how you knew you, you struck gold as a parent, right? When they would stop and play with that, and then on Christmas morning, you'd have to remind them, hey, you've got some other presents. That's when you knew you did good. God desires that we appreciate the grace that he has given to us. Not abuse it. He didn't give us forgiveness and grace so that we could go and sin. He freed us from sin so that we could serve him, so that we could love him, so that we could walk in freedom. We're not in bondage. And so we need to appreciate the gift that God has given to us. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 20 talk about this, but verse 20, you're probably familiar with it, says, for you are bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We often think about this, we're bought with a price like we owe God something. And we do, we owe him everything, but we're free in that. It, we, don't, we don't serve him out of obligation, we serve him out of appreciation. And so it changes our attitude. Because if we serve him out of obligation or we, we're trying to earn God's grace, then if we're not careful, we can get to the point where we're actually thinking we're doing it. Or we can actually take pride that we're doing it better than somebody else. But if we're serving him out of appreciation, we know we could never do enough to repay what God has done for us. We're just happy to get the opportunity to do what he's called us to do. And we don't have to compare ourselves to other people. We don't have to worry about where we stand with God because we can be secure in him. This is the access to God's grace that he has given to us. And so my question to you first and foremost is this. Do you know Christ as your Savior? Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 says, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He offers his grace to everyone. But we've got to receive that gift. We've got to put our faith and our trust 
in him. And if you have done that, are you walking in that grace? Are, are you accessing the grace that God has given to us? Are you still trying to earn something that God has given to you as a free gift? Are you still worried about losing something that God has said is written in heaven? Or are you appreciating the gift that God has given to us? Let's pray this morning. Gracious God, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. God, your word that reminds us of the riches that we have in you. God, I pray if there's somebody here today that does not know you as Savior, God, that today would be their day of salvation. Lord, if they're watching on the live stream, I pray that they would reach out through uh, the Facebook or YouTube or go to belmarchurch.com and contact us there. Lord, we'd love to continue this conversation. For somebody that's here this morning in person, if you don't know Christ, I'd love to talk to you after this service about that. There is no more important conversation that we could have. If you're here this morning and you do know Christ as your Savior, I hope that this message this morning has been an encouragement to you. That it has reminded you that we, we follow Jesus, we, we, we serve him out of appreciation, not out of obligation. That we, we, we don't need to continue to try to earn what he's already given to us. We don't have to worry about losing what he said he will keep secure. But rather we can walk in the freedom that comes by access to God's grace. Lord, help us to take this message, to share it with others, and to serve you out of appreciation for all that you've done for us. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen.